to this, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Joyce Esther is in her fifth year as president of Normandale Community College. Dr. Esther is a student-focused community leader who has worked in K-12, the Minnesota State System, community and industry partners, positioned Normandale as the innovative leader among higher education institutions in Minnesota. Under Dr. Esther's leadership, Normandale has continued to be one of the top transfer institutions in the state of Minnesota to the state college system and universities, including the University of Minnesota and the University of St. Thomas. And many other local four-year universities get Normandale students on a regular basis after they have done some, some great work here. So uh, it has a strong reputation in career programs such as dental hygiene, hospitality, big, big here in this area. Nursing, vacuums, and thin film technology. Maybe Joyce will have a chance to tell us about that. It's really pretty exciting. It's way over my head, but, <laughs> but it is something that, um, that that industry needs skilled and trained workers in, in that type of technology. Normandale enjoys many great collaborative programs with the Bloomington School District. I know Cheryl Martin is here today. I think I saw Cheryl come in. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for the work that you're doing in connection with us and, and many other school districts in the surrounding communities. Through continuing education and customized training, the college has worked with two local businesses, local Bloomington businesses, Immuno, oh, <coughs> Immunochemistry and Resound, uh, to achieve their goals for deed grants. And maybe you'll have a chance to talk about that with us too. Dr. Esther has been a champion for the challenges that students face on a daily basis. And you're gonna hear some startling statistics about what's happening with the student population right here with our Bloomington students. Earlier this semester, she did bring Sarah Goldrab, Goldrick Rabb, a leading scholar in the US food and housing insecurity industry to higher education and, and engaged with conversations with uh, the campus community, elected officials, community and business leaders to how we make college more affordable and accessible to our students. Last summer, she also received national honors from Phi Theta Kappa Academic Honor Society for two-year colleges for her involvement and support in Normandale's chapter. Dr. Esther is extremely excited, as am I, to talk with you all and answer any questions about the different ways that Normandale can partner with, with our industries right here in Bloomington and initiatives to make our community better. Please welcome Dr. Joyce Esther. You're welcome. Why Normandale? Very simple answer. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, I think I could, we could do this whole thing about why Normandale. First of all, I want to welcome you all here to Normandale, and I also want to welcome members of our community here from Normandale. So if you're a Normandale um, faculty, staff, employee, administrator of any kind, please wave your hand so everybody can see you. Yay! Thank you for being here. And I do that because I also wanted to know where you are, so if I get asked a really tough question, I'm going to look out <laughs> to one of you all and say, help me out with that. Um, but uh, so anyway, um, but I actually think that one of the things that's um, important about when you say why Normandale is actually these folks. It is the people that we have here. Um, our students constantly say to us when they come here, they're so surprised, which I don't understand why they're surprised, but so surprised that people are so nice, it's so welcoming, it's a place where people care and where they matter. And so I say we start there. We start with the individual, where the people, because we don't educate students, we educate people. And so it's so very important for us to make sure that we are in an environment where people can thrive. I say, I don't know, should I be looking to you or you, whatever. I think, yeah, feel free um, to look wherever. So so, um, so I would say that um, Normandale, um, we are in our 50th anniversary, as hopefully everybody knows that, because we've, we've, I think we've done a really good job of making yeah. sure everybody know that. But from the very beginning, um, with our founding president, he was very focused on making sure that Normandale would have very strong academic preparations. And so he was very intentional, intentional about having faculty who knew their craft, not only knew it, but knew how to teach it um, in this environment. And so we often say here that we specialize in the scholarship in teaching and learning. 
Um, we, I would put our faculty up against, you know, any four-year faculty there because they're really committed. But even more so, and again, not to disrespect any of our colleagues at four-year institutions, but one of the, the joys of, of two-year institutions is that our faculty are here to teach. Like, that is their role. Yes, they do research. Yes, they understand, you know, all kinds of things. But the important part of what they do is to teach. And so that opportunity to engage with students. Um, when we ask students about their experiences here, Almost always, they talk about the experiences that they have in the classroom with their faculty members, and they, they know them. And they're not, you know, we don't have classrooms of three, 400 people. Um, and so folks actually have an opportunity to learn from the faculty members who are the experts in their field. So um, I can go on and on. It, yeah, so what's the next question? Actually, um, I, I do want to segue on that. The 50th, you've been celebrating for about six months. Right? Yeah, it's a little bit longer, but yeah. Okay, okay so probably uh, since last summer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Share two stories that just surprised you in, in, in relating to the community or past students or faculty from, from all these celebrations and connections that you've had. Two? Or, or, or something that's just really been eye-opening for you. Um, well, one, I don't, I, I've probably told this before, well, I know I've told this before, in, in this whole 50th anniversary, I've met lots of people, oh, I went to Normandale, and different things like that, and I met a woman who told me her story, and her story is just amazing to me in the sense that she was what we would call a non-traditional student um, many years ago, and she was here in one of our earlier classes. She was a mom and a wife, and yet, so she was taking kind of one class at a time. Um, and so I won't go into a lot of detail, but quite frankly, it took her 10 years to get her associate's degree because she was, you know, kind of limping through. But then fast forward, she's now a faculty member at Florida State um, University because in six or seven years, she got her um, bachelor's or master's and her doctorate. I mean, like, boom, right? Wow. And so I think she's the epitome of that. It doesn't matter how long it takes. You just need to get it done and get it done in a way that makes sense for you. So that was always that was a really fun story. I got to meet her. Her granddaughter went to school here, was inaugurated in, or initiated into Phi Theta Kappa. So I got to meet her granddaughter. And she has wonderful things to say about this institution. Um, and one thing that's really important, and I don't know how many of you had the opportunity recently, as a part of our 50th anniversary, we partnered with an organization in town called Wonderlust Productions. Did anybody come to our recent play project? Um, if you did not, you missed a treat. I know Andrea um, Speck was here, and she's not able to join us this morning. But And so really quickly, what that is about, <clears throat> it's an organization, and I would encourage you to think about it for your organizations. They come in and they interview your community, however you define community. So in our case, they interviewed faculty, staff, alumni, business people, community people, just to hear their Normandale stories. And from that, they created a play. Because um, they took all of those stories together and created a play about us. And they nailed it. It was just, I mean, people, you laughed, you cried. But one of the biggest piece, it goes back to the thing I said at the beginning, one of the biggest piece that came out to everyone was that this was a place where people came with their fears, they came with their concerns, they came with their um, insecurities. But this was a place where those things either went away or were diminished, and they found success. Um, and it was loosely based on a Wizard of Oz um, oh. And the Japanese garden was very, actually our koi were amazing. We had koi in the play. They were talking koi. So, if you, you know, and it makes me now wonder, is that really what our koi is thinking about, right? Like underneath the water. And, um, and so, but again, it's this notion of people come and what do they dream? What do they wish? What do they hope? And what we can do to be a part of that. Um, the lead character was a Somali immigrant. Um, one of the other, the, the, I'm going to put it in kind of context, like the lion, the person who had a fear, was a veteran. Um, we had uh, a character who was, was looking for a brain, but it was really a person who was just not confident in who they were. Um, there was a student who was struggling with depression, 
and how do they make it through. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was pretty phenomenal, you know. And I had the opportunity to be in the play, so that was kind of fun. Um, Is and it available I, on video somewhere? You know, we do have a video. I've not seen it yet, so we'll wait and see. Um, <laughs> but, Steven, let's talk. Um, but, uh, and we are going to make it available to, um, for folks to see because, I, again, I think it really, and some of the things that we're talking about, it's these students who say um, how Normandale was, you know, alumni who say um, Normandale was a place that started them on their career. Normandale was the place that helped them understand what their passion was. Normandale was the place that they had a work study job that got them the resources that they needed. Normandale was the place that fed them when they were hungry. All of these things came out and it was just, um, so let's move on because I might start crying. So, oh my gosh, um, I got tissue in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> we're, and we're here to talk about the economic impact that all these great stories, <coughs> all this great history has had right here in this region. And of the elements of impact that Normandale has had, Joyce, uh, you know, what do you think has been the most significant to date? And you know, what do you think will be your most significant impact in the future? Well, I think the biggest piece is that community colleges, our job is to educate all comers. And so as uh, what our former chancellor used to say that while, you know, the university of fill in the blank, I won't disparage anyone, you know, they take the top 10, the top 50, the top X percent. We at Normandale, we take the top 100 percent. So we take all of the students. And whether you are, you know, perfect score in the SAT or barely pass the S SAT, not really sure about English as your first language, those are the students that we are here for. And I think that that is our access because those are the employees of the future. Those are the employees now. And so we need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to learn and to grow in a way that makes sense for them. And that's why I think what community colleges do really well because it allows people to come and go at various points of their career, very po various points of their lives, really to make meaning of kind of this educational institution but also to get into the workforce in various places. We have lots of folks, as you all probably know, who maybe start off in one career and have a degree and maybe have a degree in business or something, but all of a sudden they've decided that they want to go in another direction. They want to go into theater or they want to be a writer or they want to be um, dental hygiene, right, or nursing. I mean, so we have a lot of students in our nursing program who start off in one profession and then, you know, got the passion for nursing. And of course, those are the kinds of nurses we want, right, the people who are really passionate for that work. Um, and so those are the things I think that are really important. And I would say that um, that should never change um, as far as community colleges are concerned. It gets harder and harder because then we have to do all things for all people. Um, and so oftentimes when people talk about the success of institutions like, you know, the Harvards and things like that, okay, well, if you're taking the top 2% of, of high school graduates, you know, like quite frankly, I think all those schools should have 100% success rates because, you know, you're taken from the top, right? And so for us, we have a variety of students and all of our students are special. Um, and so I would say that those are the, the things that we have to work on, uh, that, that we focus on. The other piece though, Normandale, we um, are different compared to some community colleges is that we primarily focus on transfer. So for the most part, our students um, are interested in going on to baccalaureate degrees. But I always say that don't leave us out in those workforce discussions because it's not that our students are leaving here going right into the workforce. Some of our students are leaving here and they're gonna enter the workforce in two more years or in three more years. But that still means we're part of the workforce because oftentimes I think when you think of technical schools which do amazing work and they're putting their students directly into the workforce, they, they sometimes leave out our students and I like to say that we're part of workforce too. Um, because quite frankly, I don't think very many of our students are here, particularly our traditional students. They're not here just to be here. They want a job down the line, whatever that's going to be. So we're workforce too. And so we're really trying to focus on that a little bit more to really have students think about, okay, what is that thing that you want to do? How do we help you get there? And how do we navigate with universities across the country, definitely in the state. But we, you know, let our students know we prepare you. You can go anywhere you want to go. It, it, thank you. I'm going to segue into workforce because that definitely has a, an impact on not only our business community, <coughs> but the student base and the community at large. Joyce, talk about any pressure that your institution and or community colleges are facing or feeling regarding getting students into jobs quicker, sooner, cheaper, all of those things. 
You know, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if Normandale specifically has the pressure, but I think you hear it in the, in the, the media, you hear it um, nationally, you hear it locally about wanting students to go into the workforce. Um, and so, yes, there is some pressure, but I also think that that's a responsibility for schools like Normandale to really kind of pump the brakes on that a little bit, because I actually think that that's a lot of pressure on our young people. We're saying to like high school kids and grade school kids, okay, you're going to go in the workforce, what are you going to be doing next? You know, there's some you know, responsibility that we have to give them an opportunity to learn and develop and grow and so understand critical thinking and all those wonderful things that happen within um, the educational environment that gives them some time to develop who they are and what, what they want to do and what they want to be. But I think there are pressures because we hear the stories, we hear the narrative that, oh, students are graduating with a whole bunch of debt, they can't find jobs. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of that, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but a lot of that data, when you hear that, I would ask you to really unpack that a little bit because not every student is graduating with miles and miles, you know, hundreds and millions of dollars worth of debt. Um, yes, there are students who do, but a vast majority of our students don't, you know, and, and not the kind of debt that is insurmountable. Um, and I think that we really need to understand that a little bit more. And so I really want to make sure that our students come and they understand what professions they want to get into. I mean, how many of you had a job or a profession at some point and you, you know, like, this is what you want to do. And then you get there and you're like, this is not for me. <laughs> well, that's also wasted time and energy. So if we're forcing folks to go into a field or profession for which they really have no aptitude for, no desire for, how much time is money is wasted there? How about give them some opportunity, some opportunity here at a community college where tuition is cheaper to kind of, you know, play around with some things, really find that, that thing that's going to give them joy, that thing that is going to um, sustain them in their family. And so um, I'm... Oh, I know this is being taped, but um, I absolutely think that people need, you know, good wages and people need good professions, but I also think that we can't discount people being able to be fulfilled in what they do. Um, and you can't put a price tag on that. And I think that one of the things that we do really well here, particularly as an institution that looks at liberal arts, that looks at STEM, looks at all the other things that students could do, gives students opportunities to kind of figure it out before then they then go invest you know, a whole bunch of time and money and in energy into a profession that really may not be for them. I appreciate everything you just said. Thank One you. of the, yeah, absolutely, and I'm sure that that many of you that <coughs> that stirs a lot of angst and or uh, uh, comfort, no matter how you're looking at that. I think. Uh, one of the areas that I've had the pleasure of getting involved with are the mock interviews. The way that you're tying the business community in and bringing us right into your college, coming in. And if you guys haven't had a chance to do, ha has anybody in here also helped out with mock interviews? Yeah, uh, what, a, what a tremendous opportunity to come in and help prepare these students. Thank you, Jody. <coughs> for for the world of work, if they are entering uh, uh, even a two-year institution like this, and some of them have never had a job before, you know, they, and so that opportunity to give them the, that, that real-world experience of interviewing, uh, I'm, I'm tough but, but fun in my interviews. Uh, but, but seriously, I want to... I wanna Can I also say one other Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, this is your show. Oh, thank you. All right, so anyway, no. Um, <laughs> One of the things, like when you talk about business, so a lot of our business faculty mm -hmm. are folks who have worked in business, are, are working mm -hmm. in business. These are not just people who are telling you what the theory says. These are people who are telling you what they know based on their experiences. And I think that that's one of the other values of a community college is that you also have practitioners, right? So like our nursing faculty are working nurses. They don't, they're not just telling students what they heard and what they read in a book. These are folks who are working in the field. And I think that that's also what makes community colleges, definitely Normandale, that much more special, particularly for those fields that will lead people directly into the workforce. And so that, I just really want to put that out there. Absolutely. And maybe share a little bit quickly, <coughs> another impact that you have in the area is your dental hygiene program. You know that you all can get your teeth cleaned right here at Normandale? Yeah. Uh, no. Where do we sign up? <laughs> Upstairs. <laughs> We're going to do that right after this. Everybody get ready. Yeah, we have an amazing dental hygiene program. 
Um, and so we actually have a dental clinic, which is a wonderful resource for the community. Um, we have several of our community partners who know about it. So there are certain times of the year you'll have some of our senior members of our community um, using that, that resource. And it's, it's really inexpensive, but it's an opportunity to give our students the opportunity to work in a real live you know, clinic environment. And it also gives community members opportunities to really advanced um, uh, dental practices as far as their, their equipment. Um, there's been a couple times over the years where we've had students say, oh my gosh, the equipment that I have here is better than the equipment I have working <laughs> at the office that you know I'm interning in or working at. Um, and so we have really good partners there. And so it's really amazing. Um, before I forget, Jody is offering, if anyone would like a tour of our campus or parts of our campus after the fact, we'll give you a tour and let you go up to the dental clinic. Okay. Um, and you can make an appointment, too, if you need to. <laughs> That's great. You use the word internship, and I'd like to talk about that. Talk about the program. I know we're working closely with Velvet Walker, who is um, with Employer Relations. And so I, I would like very much to hear how this is part of that workforce again you know you're giving the students this wonderful opportunity for a well-rounded education and then how are you also funneling them in to try out certain industries certain jobs and roles that they've been studying for yeah this is an area i think that we have an opportunity um, i think some of our areas particularly our hospitality students and some of those programs they absolutely have those opportunities to do internships or externships or just kind of job shadowing and things like that. So we do have those opportunities. I think that there is an opportunity for us to do a little bit more of that. Again, as an institution that is a transfer institution, that really has not been our focus. Um, sure. But then you have students who are like, let me, let me try this out and let me see what's going on. But I would say in our, um, our more, if I will, traditional workforce type programs, those are the ones where you'll see more often where we have internships and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, our, in all honesty, and we'll get to this later, but a lot of our students, if you understand the demographics of community college students, it's a little bit dip, more difficult sometimes for our students to do internships if they're not paid internships because a vast majority of our students need to work. And so the opportunity for them to go to school and, and work a job, and if it's an internship that absolutely would help them, but if it's an internship that's that's not paid, then that's you know a missed opportunity for them to earn an income. And so one of the things I would say to business communities is to think about if you want to partner with us, I think the most appropriate is opportunities for paid internship in some way because a vast majority of our students need to work. Um, and they would love to have internships, um, but that's taking away time from family studying um, unemployment. So I would just encourage that as well. It's complicated. It's very complicated because, and we'll get into it, but the student, I mean, how many, I don't know how many of us in the room have gone to college and you went to college. It's a different day for our students. I mean, I didn't come from a very um, privileged background, but I still had the luxury of not working while I was in college. I still had the luxury of just going to school and focusing on school. And I came from a single family home with my mom, my mom not making a lot of money. If I was in school right now, it'd be a different environment let's for me. talk let's let's go there I do it we, we can skip over this question because when we were here for the ovations breakfast many of you in this room heard her talk about these statistics that she's going to share with us and they are startling about what our student population right here in this community is going through will you share those with us yeah, so again, for folks who were here, literally right um, as I was running down, I, this report showed up. So as she talked about, as uh, Kim talked about, we had uh, Dr. Goldrick Rabb, who is a leading scholar, talking about the unmet needs of students um, on college campuses. And she talks a lot about financial aid. She talks about um, housing insecurity, food insecurities, homelessness of our students and the demographics of our students. So she engaged in a national research that looked across the, um, the nation and campuses could um, volunteer to be part of it and so you could actually not only get her national data but you could find out of the students from your campus who filled out her survey what the demographics were and so I'll share with you so nationally um, she listed things like um, food insecurity so things about students who wrote things like um, on the survey um, in the last, I think it was 30 days, you know, I didn't have enough food to make it to the end of the month, or I did not know where the next meal was coming from, that kind of housing insecure, or food insecure. Um, then she also talked about housing insecurity, and that's those folks who, you know, are couch surfing, or those folks who, you know, are moving from family home to family home, and they really don't have their own address. They have 
you know, a place to lay their head, but it's really insecure. They don't know when they're going to get put out. And then homeless for those folks who literally have no home, have no place, maybe living in cars, maybe living at bus stations. Um, nationally, 45% um, reported that they were in um, food insecure in the last 30 days. 56% um, said that they were housing insecure at some point in the previous year. Um, and 14% said they were homeless at some point in the previous year. That was nationally. So now it's a little, I'm sad to bring the, the energy down, but our Normandale numbers, um, we only had about uh, 500 and some odd students um, who responded to the survey. But as I like to say that out of that 500, I got some information. And so that's telling me that there's some people in our population who have experienced some of these things. So for Normandale, in the last 30 days, 36% 30, uh, of our respondents said they were food insecure. 48% said they were housing insecure in the previous year. And 19% said they were homeless in the previous year really startling statistics. And as we, you know, my job here is to graduate students, to get students to complete. Well, how difficult can it be to study, to persist, to retain from year to year when you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from, where you're not sure where you're going to sleep tonight. Um, those, those are really startling statistics. And so one of the things that we have to think about is how do we um, engage with our students in, in, in a humane way, in a way that's really going to help them um, be successful. Um, one of the other things that I was looking for, and I have some of the data, the Minnesota Department of Higher Ed also did um, uh, a research that looked at high school students. And interestingly enough, in their data, so if you look at kind of the correlation between maybe their ACT or the ACT scores and even their graduation rate. So this is from their report, and I can't remember the year that this is reporting, but um, of students who are housing insecure, they have a graduation rate at 50%. So 50% 50, 50 of students who are housing insecure graduated, right? Um, but if you are housing insecure, but yet you are on free and reduced lunch, and so you can kind of say that might be a proxy for food insecure, right? Um, it gets a little bit better because you have housing insecurity, you have housing security, but not um, food security. Um, you graduate at a rate of 76%. But if you don't have either one of those, you graduate at a rate of 94%. So again, the, the, the major differences um, of our students, even if you look at the ACT scores, I'll go in the other direction. If you have no housing insecurity, you have no food insecurity, the average um, ACT was 23.9. But if you're housing secure, but yet you're on free and reduced lunch, your average ACT score was 20.2. But if you're housing insecure, 18. So again, ACT, for those of you that don't know, lots of times ACT scores are used to help you get into universities around. So again, if the lower the ACT scores, the less likely that you're going to be able to get into the University of X. Places like Normandy will here for you, right? Because if your score is 18, if your scores are 23, your scores are 33, we got you, right? Um, but understand, these are the challenges that the students are facing um, on a daily basis. And though, these are the things that break our hearts. Um, but on the same token, we at Normandale and colleges around the country are really trying to figure these things out. We have a, um, a food pantry on our campus. And I remember, and I tell this all the time, one of our board members of our foundation, when he was coming on the board and he was giving a tour, and we showed him the food pantry, he was like, food pantry? Like, that was just, like, like it just didn't compute. Like, why do you have a food? Students need, like, really. And our food pantry is one that's designed to give students food to, while they're here, right? So it's not even groceries to take back home. Um, but I just heard from one of our, the coordinator who runs that program, that a student had gone the other day. And it's, and it's not, we're not talking filet mignon or anything. It's ramen noodles. It's, you know, um, macaroni and cheese and things like that. And there was a student who said, oh, I'll take the macaroni and cheese because my sister likes that. That tells me that, that she wasn't getting that for here, she was getting that for home, right? And so those are the kinds of things that break your heart. So what also, though, gives me joy, so let me lift up the room a little bit, is that when you know that these are our students' demographics, and then we see our students walk across the stage, graduation is on the 20th, and we see them tell us that they got jobs, or when we see them tell us that they got admitted into XYZ University, knowing that these are the kinds of things that they were struggling with, 
I mean, that just makes you pump out your chest and be really excited and proud for them. Because if you can imagine just how far along they could be if they didn't have these struggles, how much further they could, could go, there's a move for a lot of people to say, okay, students, need to go to school full time because there is a correlation between if you go full time you have greater success rates. Well, I mean, in all honesty, there's a lot of students, if they could go full time, they would, right? And so there's this push about, well, students should go full time, they should do these, that, these other things. We're ignoring the fact that students have all kinds of um, other issues in their lives. Um, we often hear about students who need childcare. Well, I thought this was really interesting. I was talking to a student because typically when I hear students are concerned about childcare, you always think about students and their own children. Well, I was talking to a student and he was giving me stories of other folks that it's not so much my, their own children, it's their siblings. Mm -hmm. It's the childcare because I have to now leave here because mom and dad are working two and three jobs and I gotta go pick up my little brother or sister or older brother and sister from someplace. Um, it's a different environment. Um, so I'm going to stop because I think I'm just depressing everyone. No, but no, but, I, but the other thing is that impact. but the other piece is that um, knowing where students are coming from, we, let's put it back into our our work partners. You know, whether it be internships or whether it be jobs, we're trying to help students break these cycles of um, uh, generational poverty. Um, as a matter of fact, there was a um, in the play at the end of the play students got to say their I wishes, like I wish for my life in the future. And one of the lines from the play is a student says, or no, I will. And the student says, I will be on my yacht because I have broken the generational poverty. Right? So I think our students are thinking forward. They're thinking about where they're going to be in the future. And so um, what are the jobs that are going to get them past those entry level jobs, past those, um, those jobs that um, pay you know, entry level wages, but maybe aren't the jobs that sustain a family. And one of the things I also think is somewhat of a misnomer when we talk about people who are in, in unemployment. Let's just be really honest, the unemployment rate in our state is low. Right? But if you disaggregate and you look at communities of color, and if you look at particularly African-American men, they have high unemployment rates, much higher than um, the, the rate that we often like to talk about. Like here in Minnesota, we have single digit unemployment rates. There are populations though within this state that have double digit unemployment rates. And so what can we do to support those individuals because they need and want to be in the workforce as well. And so those are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. And so what are we doing as we are preparing students for the workforce as we're preparing students for um, baccalaureate programs and beyond, what is the world of work? Is the world of work ready to accept these new immigrants? Are, is the world of work ready to accept, you know, maybe, you know, our, our veterans who are coming back and trying to figure out what's going on? Are they ready to accept some people who maybe have had some you know, hiccups in their past that, you know, aren't violent or anything else, but maybe they've been in the penal system, um, but yet they have an opportunity. There's a, an amazing story. Um, you mentioned Phi Theta Kappa. Just recently, Phi Theta Kappa is our international honor society for two-year colleges, an amazing organization. Just recently, they um, elected their new student president internationally, and he's a young man who had been incarcerated, um, but yet he came out of jail, got his life together, and is an advanced student, you know, great GPA, I mean, those are the kinds of things. Great and we need model. to be really intentional. One of the things that we often say when we talk about equity and inclusion, we often say, how do we prepare students of color for institution? And really the question is, how do we prepare institutions for these individuals? And I would say the same thing for our business community. You know, oftentimes business communities say, well, we need folks, we can't find folks. I, I actually beg to differ. You know, it always, it confuses me when people say we can't find employees. I, I mean, and, and, and I'm, I'm not saying that folks maybe aren't necessarily prepared, but we're graduating people at universities and colleges around the country of folks who want to go to work. And so what is the responsibility also of the business community to kind of step up to those individuals and say, okay, you've got this degree, you have this, but now here's what we're willing to do to kind of help you maybe meet the standards that we have in our institution. Because there's industries all over the country and all over the world, and we can't possibly teach <laughs> to every single industry you know, specific that you have maybe for your company. But what can the companies do to say, okay, you have these kind of baseline um, skills, and we're willing to come in and help support you to get to that next level because there are students who want to work. There are students who 
um, want to be engaged in your organizations, in, in your industry. And so I think there has to be a partnership. It can't just be, oh, we can't find them. I'm telling you, like, we're about to have commencement, you know, and there's what, about 300 and some odd students walking in commencement, another several hundred, if not thousand, who are actually completing. You know, I bet you if one of you just walked in, you know, and asked a student, here, I'll give you a job, they'd be like, okay, sign me up. You know, now you might have to teach them, you know, the, you know, rib cue way, if you will, you know, but they might, you know, have the skills of creative thinking and they can do math and they can, you know, do accounting and all that, but maybe they don't understand some of the things in the culture of your organization. Um, those are the things that you can lean into our students and help them as well. I think I went off topic a little bit, but. No, I'm going to turn it to the audience right now. And that was pretty impactful. Would you agree? No, like, yeah. Yeah, I would like somebody to respond. I would like somebody from the business community. I know Jim is anxious to say something. I'd like <laughs> Jim, in addition to anybody else here in the, in the business community, to talk about what they're doing in a hiring capacity. Talk about how you're looking at bringing diversity and inclusion into your workforce, if you are so brave. Jim, you first. <laughs> Thank you. As a 38 year citizen here in Bloomington, watch Normandale grow into the institution it is. I said every once in a while we come here and I said it's like walking into an international village. It's a city in, inside of a city and it's, it's under the leadership and the foundation and everybody else that's done so well. They're one of our great partners in the Bloomington schools that we offer a program that the students can get their college credits while attending High school, many of you know the program is PSEO, but we have had several over the last couple of years where they've graduated from Normandale at the end of May and then they walk with their high school graduation in June. So it's been a very successful program for the students who want to learn and have a, 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 an opportunity to learn here. And so it's worked out really well. As well as our community education program, we have a, adult basic education program where when we ask them at their graduation, <clears throat> I think nine tenths of them are coming over here to Normandale to continue their education. And this is mainly the immigrant population that we have. So as we work through these things, Normandale is such a significant partner and businesses should certainly take advantage of that. Thank you, Jen. I guess there wasn't a question. <laughs> you always have something good to say. So who would like to, from the audience, address some of the things that Joyce talked about? Yes. Dr. Ezra, I've read <coughs> several studies and it talks about the uh, uh, trying to break the cycle of poverty. And it seems like one of the most important factors is a strong mentoring relationship. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what Normanville has? To help students for that? You know, I first say one of the things that's really important is informal mentoring, right? Um, everyone here on campus um, takes an interest in our students. And again, I'm going to go back to the play because the play did a really good job of demonstrating who we are. But there's a part of the play where um, the fish, who then turn into general maintenance workers, are there to support the students. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have these opportunities where you have, you know, our general maintenance workers who are walking on campus, you know, they're sweeping up something, but they turn to a student, so how was your test the other day, right? And so you have these informal mentorship that happens. And I think, and I don't want to um, kind of gloss over that because I think that that's really important because those are the folks who see the students every day around the same time when they're in that, you know, in this corner doing this, that, and the other, they can see a student. Um, I think our faculty and staff um, and engage in those mentoring opportunities. Um, we have, we have um, advisory councils for some of our programs, and there's opportunities for mentors there. Um, obviously, our, our faculty, I already said this though, but our faculty and staff engage in that. We probably could do more of that. We do engage with organizations, as Kim talks about, when we do the mock um, interviews or whatnot, we bring in people from the community, and those opportunities turn into mentoring. I have a group of students that, I, um, that are called the Presidential Ambassadors, and these are students who kind of do tours and are the spokespeople for our institution when I have to go and do things. And one of the, the benefits of being a Presidential Ambassador is I ask the students what is it that they want to do, and then I find people in the community who actually are doing that, and then they have those relationships. And so there's a lot of that. I, I think that there are, are some opportunities for us to do a little bit more of that. Um, but again, it really requires 
us to be really flexible because again, our students' lives are so very different. Um, I, I mentored a student and I kept trying to schedule time with her and every time she's like, oh wait, I gotta get to work or this happened or this happened and so, because their lives are so compact and it's not, or, or so, um, um, uh, Complex, thank you, I couldn't get the word out. Um, and so we have to be really creative about how we mentor, um, but I think that that absolutely needs to happen. Um, it doesn't happen as much as it probably should, but absolutely I would agree with you on that. And Terry, thank you for bringing that up. That is something that the Chamber of Commerce is very um, excited about and focused on. There are members of our workforce committee that are right here in the room, and this is we talked about this yesterday at our workforce uh, committee meeting in how we can be that clearinghouse. We want to be that connector between the business community and the, the, the Bloomington School District, Normandale and the University of Minnesota, frankly, and find ways to, to start to create some of those mentor relationships. And I think that, so please, um, there's going to be a survey, um, and put a plug right now, there's a survey that, is, that we, we sent out, but it was buried in a newsletter that I did. And so we didn't get much of a, of a return, so Anna, has been, um, she, I know she's not in the room right now, but she's been working very hard to make this mobile friendly. So at all, we, we, we tried to get it ready for you all to take today, but it's a survey so that we can get information about what you need from the chamber. What can we provide you to help your businesses with some of these <coughs> workforce issues? So please be aware that that's going to be unveiled uh, probably at the end of this month, if not um, for the next conversation with Kemp. But I do want to, um, I want you to look out and I would like you all to recognize that you have these resources. Now Mark Atkins at the Ovations Breakfast did a fabulous job with the Ask. Uh, Joyce did a great job with the Ask. Jody did a great job with the Ask. And I believe you guys raised quite a bit of money, correct? $106,000 from this community. Thank you. So those are, that's one set of resources. And so I know we're talking about mentorship, we're talking about ways to get people into your business uh, it, you know, in, in, in different ways, uh, different avenues, but how can the business community, and, and if anybody's got ideas, shout them out. This is the audience participation part of the program. If, how can the business community help? So, you know, before I answer that, if you don't mind, one of the things yeah. that I know that you and I talked about that would be interesting, and some of you heard it if you were at the State of the City with the mayor, because he mentioned some of our data mm -hmm. about the economic impact that Normandale has. And so I just wanted to really quickly share that because I, then I yes. think it would really quickly dovetail into kind of this makes the case for why our business community should be a partner with us. Mm -hmm. So our system engaged in a study um, to look at all of our campuses and what the economic impact is. And I was really impressed. Like there are 37 institutions within Minnesota State, seven um, universities and uh, 30 community colleges. And of all of them, Normandale was the fourth highest total amongst all community colleges and universities about our economic impact. So that means that larger than some of our universities even. Um, and so according to their data that um, Normandale contributed a combined economic contribution to the region of, are you ready for this? $400 million. $400 million. Yeah. So this includes direct wow. impact of $207 million and indirect induced impact of about $193 million. Um, and so again, direct is generated by, as a result of spending by Minnesota State on capital projects. And so as you can see, a lot of the things that we're doing here, our new parking lot, some folks saw, we're gonna be doing some more building. Um, the increased demand on goods and services. So 14,000 students come through here every year. So, you know, they're going to the local stores, they're going to the gas stations, they're doing all of these other kinds of things um, and induced. Um, and so it also impacts, employer impact in the region 3,474 jobs. So again, Normandale has an impact in our region um, in that way. Also, there's about 2,184 2, direct jobs, which means you know, in our employees and the jobs created by our students spending money on goods and services is which, how they came to this. Um, and then about 1,290. Um, we employ about 608 um, employees on campus, plus or minus, um, depending on the day and the year. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is Normandale State and local tax impact is about $24 million. 
So we have an impact. And so having students come here, having students be successful, and one of the reasons that students come here is that they know, oh, I'm going to get a good education. I'll be able to transfer to the university of fill in the blank, or I'll be able to get a good job. So therefore, they'll come here. And so the more that we can do that, the more it feeds the environment um, of our workforce. Um, I think that it's so very important for our workforce community um, to get involved. One of the things that we also didn't talk about is um, our partnership program. We have program uh, partners with in, um, universities such that students can get their baccalaureate degrees at Metropolitan State University, Southwest Minnesota State, and Metropolitan State University right here on this campus. Because a lot of our students, and some of you maybe even from the, the local high school understand this too, a lot of our students because of their family commitments, their life commitments, or just plain like in this area, um, wants to stay here and they don't want to go off. And one of the things that um, a lot of people recognize is that when students go away for college, a lot of them stay wherever that away happens to be. And the more we can get students to stay in the community, then you have more workers. You have more folks who are engaging in communities, buying homes, doing all those other kinds of things. So I think that's why it's really important because we have an impact on our community to get our students to here. And we have lots of students who really want to stay here. I have students asking me, like, when are you going to get an X degree over across there? Because I really don't want to leave. Like, you know. Um, um, and I actually had one student choose their baccalaureate degree based on what was over there because they did not want to leave. One, I think we made it really nice for them and so they, they love it here. Actually, there's a part in the play where we have a commencement scene where a student hands me their diploma and says, can you hold on to this because I'm going to get my baccalaureate degree here because this place works for me. Um, and that's really what our students are about. So I think our business community really should understand that we do have an impact. Um, you know, we have the Mall of America, we have the airport, we have Normandale, right? Um, these are places that are really important in this community. We also um, pull from students all over the state, quite frankly, and so our students come from a very wide, so they're not all right here in Bloomington, Richfield, Edina, Eden Prairie. We have students from all over. Um, but we do have a, a large share of our students here. So our workforce um, for folks who want to be in this community, I think we need to partner with you all. You, need all. you all need to partner with us and have conversations. It needs to really be, um, and, and, and most of everyone in this room that I actually know, you all have been really good partners to us. And so I'm actually speaking to the others out there who might see this, but to be able to come kind of like the Mall of America, they don't just come to us and say, we need more people in hospitality. What are you going to do? They say, okay, we need it. How can we help you do that? Which is how that job, um, uh, fair came out in that whole thing. It was a partnership. It wasn't like we need this. It was we need it, but here's what we can do to help you help us. And those are the kinds of relationships. As you know, we are funded by the state and by tuition. And so um, we have limited dollars to do certain things. And so we would like to do lots of different things. Um, but when we can partner together, that's really helpful because there are some things I have to say no to um, because I don't have the resources for. Um, and so if you can help us to do those things. Um, and I really liked how, you know, um, the partnerships with the high schools and was talked about because we have our Dimensions Academy um, program. It's really interesting. One of the things that because Normandale is so good, people are coming to us. And so if you saw the um, Care Eleven news, you know, um, talking about yeah. one of our students um, who is 10 years old, um, who's been with us for two years to so do the math, started when he was eight, yes. Um, and But as a, as a result of that, you've got parents in the community who have other profoundly gifted students who are like, hmm, what, you know, and so how do we, we're going to have to partner more with our K-12, you know, schools to kind of say, how can we do that? Because I can't always be all things to all people. And so Dimensions Academy is a wonderful program. This is a for um, pretty gifted ninth and 10th graders. Um, and as he said, get an opportunity to get a whole bunch of credits such that then they do PSEO and then they already have an associate's degree. Um, one story that I always tell um, is we have a student who is a PSEO student graduated from us, went on to Harvard. And so, you know, Harvard's expensive, although he got some really good financial aid. But here's the thing, he's only gonna have to spend two years at Harvard because of all of the coursework that he had here. And as I say to him and everyone else, his Harvard diploma doesn't look any different than somebody who was there for four years and spent four years of that tuition. At the end of the day, he's got a Harvard, you know, diploma just like the folks who are there, but yet he has like not the debt to go with it. And so this is the place for that, whether students want to go to a Harvard, you know, want to go to Mankato, want to go to Augsburg, want to go to fill in the blank, right? Um, they can do that.
sorry, I went off the script a little oh, bit. Oh, this, this is great. That we're highlighting you. Questions highlighting from the audience? Them. Yes. Dr. Esther, could you talk a little bit about continuing education and customized training? Because many people don't know about that, and that is a huge resource for this group. Thank you. See, that's why I have employees and, and folks here to help me out. <laughs> Um, and it was on my notes, so thank you. Um, but actually, yes, we have continuing education, customized training. And so really what that is, is two parts of the puzzle. One is that customized training, so there are some industry, particularly smaller companies, maybe who don't have their own internal professional development arm, or maybe it just doesn't make sense for them to kind of create some kind of program. One of the things I really liked, and this is probably not the best example, but I just think it's really neat that our continuing education, customized training group work with an area police department to train them on um, Spanish, right, to help them be better community police in their area, to understand conversational Spanish that would help them. So do they need the, um, the very academic, you know, Spanish class where we're going to conjugate verbs and do all those kinds of things that are very important? No, but we have some very customized training that's going to say, how do I say, how are you, good morning, how's your family, you know, nice to meet you, how can I help those things that help you be um, um, an engaged citizen as law enforcement. So I thought that was really an amazing example. But our, there are opportunities so your company can work with our customized training um, area to really come up with some programs that could help meet the needs of your industry. Brenda Dickinson, who is our dean, I'm pointing over here, so if you'd like to talk to her afterwards about some of these things. And then we also have continuing education. You, know, you have the folks who are like, I haven't been in school for years, really don't want to sign up for that 18-week course, um, really not really sure if I'm ready to go into it, or I don't remember how to use a computer, so maybe I'm going to come and take a computer class just so I can understand the ins and outs before I sign up. Um, or I need some understanding about financial management at, with my business, right? I have a you know one person shop and I'm selling things on eBay or whatever, and I need to understand you know data processing or, or or financial management. You can go and get some continuing education courses. I am making um, really small examples, but of, of a lot of work that happens there. Um, so, and Brenda can do much better than I can. And we have a table right up there. <laughs> So again, for the, um, those folks who didn't hear, there's a table outside, but you can go onto our website and look up continuing education and customized training to get some um, other information. Thank you, Jody. Other questions? Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I go to a lot of technology conferences, and there, there seems to still be ongoing issues of getting women into STEM-related fields. And I'm wondering, because that, that impacts workforce, because you want to have a diverse workforce you know, across the board, I'm wondering what you're seeing and what you're doing at Normandale in those areas, maybe. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, I don't have the data in front of me, but this is very, very anecdotally. Last year, and I'm actually going to be going to another one today, it's really interesting. All of, at the end of the year, a lot of our departments have end of the year celebration, chemistry and all these, and they'll talk about who the top students are. I remember last year when I went to the event, all of our top students were women. It was like, whoa, look at that, right? And so um, I think for us, part of it is that you know we have female faculty in those fields, and so our young women, um, can see that there are folks, you know, as role models, going back to that whole role modeling and mentoring, they can see folks in that field. And so um, I think it's a matter of making sure that we situate people in the environment so that um, they, they know what's going on and that they know that they have a place in those environments. Um, with the STEM Link conference that Kim mentioned, um, that's an opportunity for young, you know, kids to really see the STEM fields and really experience it firsthand. And again, an opportunity for us to demonstrate and show our, our faculty um, who are from diverse backgrounds and our faculty who represent um, differences that will these students can go, oh my gosh, I can see myself in it. And also with the STEM Link, it's really cute. Um, they actually get to go up into our dental clinic, put on the little paper gown, and like play on, you know. Um, um, a little head or whatever, but I think it allows them to see themselves in that space. It allows them to understand, oftentimes um, we talk about um, girls in STEM, oh, I know, we actually have a summer camp 
and that very directly goes to your point and it is a s summer camp for girls specifically looking at stem fields and so one year they looked at construction so they actually had um, went out to when they were building u.s bank stadium they got to have a tour there one year they focused on coding another year um, they and they do a really interesting way to make it just relatable for them and so that's a one way that we start really young because i, I think we really have to start young because sadly if you really understand some of the developmental processes that young men and women go through there's like this pitch point sometimes where for some reason like if you ask little bitty girls you know like what's your favorite subject it's like math and they love to say that but then somewhere along the line for whatever reason it's not something that they want to say and so we're trying to break that so that while they're saying math and, and science I love those and they continue to say math and science I love those and so by us being part of the the summer camp for girls is one of the ways that we start to do that. Other questions? Yes. How is this, getting away from academics, how is the security system, does normally have its own security force and or all of that safety in buildings? Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, we love the Bloomington Police Department. Um, so we have our own public safety. Um, and the public safety is really about customer service. It's really about engaging with people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we are here with Bloomington, and Bloomington is very supportive of us, and we have really great relationships with them. Um, but we stay on top of all of, you know, sadly in this day and age that we that we have, we have all kinds of, you know, security and safety measures on campus through technological things and door locks and, and those things, and we have drills and, and all of those. Um, but when we when you talk about kind of the hardcore things, gotta love the police department who's really close. <laughs> Anything else? I'm just curious. Any of you ever taken a class at Normandale? If so, raise your hand. Yay! Okay, that's all. Anyone graduate from here by any chance? Okay. All right. I'm gonna sign up for a Spanish class. It's in my bucket, and I'm gonna do it. Actually, if I can say something really quickly, that really leads to, so when you take Spanish, maybe the next time we go, we have a group of students who are about to go to Peru. Um, we have a focus on um, internationalizing the curriculum and global studies. And we, as a community college, I actually think we do very robust study abroad and um, outboard learning kinds of things. And so I'm really excited that we got a grant that we will be teaching in the fall Somali language, and which is really amazing, and then followed by Somali culture. Uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, we will be talking a lot about diaspora studies, and so that's really exciting. And I think for our business communities, because so many of your businesses are international, and making sure that our students have an understanding of how do you not only you know get through and get along in, in, in our culture and our community here, but how do you deal across you know the pond or however you want to um, describe that. And so we're really excited about that. Last year, a group of our students and community members went to Senegal um, for students who study French because oftentimes when you know you say oh I study French we're gonna go abroad you're gonna go to Paris or France which is great but there are lots of places in the world that speak French and so we went to Senegal same thing with our students who are teaching who are learning Spanish there are opportunities like oh well you know you don't have to go to Spain or Mexico there's other places for which Spanish is spoken so um, that group will be leaving actually next week I think or sometimes two weeks so yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah, Mark, please. I just, I just want to put a pl little plug in for the foundation. And um, uh, we're, we're pretty proud of our foundation, uh, our board. Uh, this is the most engaging board I've ever worked with. Uh, you, you've heard Joyce, and that, that passion and the needs filter down into our board members, and, and they're very engaged. Um, Last year we gave out like 720 scholarships, but it's not just scholarships that we give out. Uh, Joyce mentioned students that have a lot of needs. We provided car batteries, uh, fixed tires, provided rent payments, utility payments. There was a student that was using his phone to do his homework, and we provided an iPad. Uh, but, but there's a lot of other things other than scholarships that we provide. But as you guys sit here, um, we, we have term limits on our board. And we're always looking for good board members, people that want to be engaged. So when you go back into your communities, if you think about it, or if you're interested yourself, we'd love to talk with you about opportunities for service within our board. Thank you. Great plug. I'm glad you had a chance to say that, Mark. Thank you. 
Well, I know we could keep talking because she's so interesting. What's happening here is very interesting, but thank you all so much for coming and let's give Joyce a round of applause.